All right, what you're looking at here is a 1956 Zenith. This would probably be considered a portable black and white television. And this came from a friend of mine's mine site, the dump, where all of the goods out of the employee housing was dumped when the mine closed in the 70s. So this has been presumably sitting outside in the desert wind and rain and summer heat and everything else being sandblasted and roasted uh, since probably the late 70s early 80s so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna try and resurrect this set if you're new to this channel welcome if you came here because you like underground mine exploration videos I've moved all of those to a new channel called mine explorers I could post a link to that in the description below. Mine Explorers, two words. In this video, I'm going to attempt to resurrect this set. I'm not going to restore it. I'm not gonna try and make it perfect. I'm just gonna try and bring it back to life. There's not gonna be any cleanup, or polishing, or painting, or recapping. I'm just gonna do the bare minimum to try and bring it back to life. If I run into something, a catastrophic problem, like a bad transformer or something like that that's not easily repairable, then the thing simply goes in the trash. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and do a little rotation of this thing here. That way we can do a 360 view, everybody can do a 360 view of what we're going to be working on today. In this video, you can see the handles there on the side below the knobs. And you can see that all of the valve tube vacuum tube bulbs have been removed except a few and a lot of the wires have been cut. So I don't know why that happened, whoever threw this thing into the dump. And by the way, there should have been a previous video showing me going through the dump at the mine and testing the CRTs in several of these and this one checked out okay. So amazing there. All right, introducing the new 1956 Zenith portable 20 inch black and white for your home entertainment pleasure. And let me say this, this thing is baked. I mean this thing is roasted. And you can see it is so roasted that all the insulation is missing off the vertical output transformer. It's an exposed winding as well as the audio output transformer. Lots of cut wire. Unfortunately, I don't know why someone cut these wires. They didn't take the copper. So his power transformer set, here's the high voltage container. One baked ass flyback with expo exposed coils. Here's the tuner. Of course, the speaker's completely gone. Yoke looks like it's seen better days. Whole bunch of wires have been cut up here. Originally, the controls were up here. Take a look at the SAMs. And this is how I identified this set. Because there's no numbers on here. I counted the tubes. 
and in Zenith the chassis number begins with the number of the tubes. So then what I did is I counted 17 tubes on this chassis. Then I went into the SAMS book and I started to pull all of the SAMS that started with the chassis 17. So this is a 17X20, 17X22. And I actually figured we, were, we would get so deep into this thing in this video that I took my original copy of the SAMS to Kinko's and photocopied it. That way we can draw on it, uh, we can analyze it in the video. Because this is a power transformer set, so all the tube filaments are in parallel and I don't need all the tubes in place for them to heat up. And because all the tubes are missing, I'm going to break this down into sections and I think that'll be more educational. Because at this point, there's so few people that are actually working on old sets like this that the user pretty much has to be the serviceman. And I get contacted often, will you fix my old set or restore my old set? Well, at this point, no, I'm not doing any of that anymore. It's too much of a headache. So watch the video and hopefully you can learn how to do it yourself. I know I have really weird ways of doing stuff, but I think logically and diagnostically in the real world, they play out real well. So this is a Sam's photo fact here in the States. This was a company that pretty much covered every piece of consumer electronics for a good part of 50 years and they're all laid out the same. So. Over here is the power supply, sectioned off all by itself. Then down here, this is the horizontal output high voltage, right here. So we have our horizontal AFC, horizontal oscillator, multivibrator, horizontal output, high voltage rectifier, and am I out of the frame yet? And damper tube is over here. Okay, so this is a flyback. So basically, this right here is one separate section, one separate circuit, and this should work by itself. Okay, if this is, if we get the power supply to work and if we get this to work right here, that should give us a vertical line on the CRT. Okay, up here, this is our vertical deflection, vertical output transformer, vertical multivibrator output, and this is the sink. So this is a separate circuit up here. Of course, the yoke is right here. Then up here, this is our IF, okay, and our video over here. We're not worried about this right now. This up here at the top is our audio. So this is, this is a separate circuit. And it kind of needs to work from the bottom up because if the horizontal doesn't work, you won't have high voltage and you won't have horizontal deflection. If the vertical doesn't work, you won't have vertical deflection. So this bottom part, the power supply on this bottom part will give us, should give us light on the CRT. It should give us a line, a vertical line on the CRT. This should give us, adding this should give us a raster. Adding this up here, if this is working, this should give us video and possibly a picture. Then adding this up here should give us sound. This over here is the tuner. We're not going to worry about the tuner. Good, good possibility the tuner is done forever with as much rust and that is on here. The tuner is kind of very sensitive. And also I'd like to say that this down here is the most problematic part of the set because this is the highest power part of the set. So usually the most power, the more heat, more power, more heat more problems so that goes from the bottom up too of course usually there's kind of the least problems with the audio because it's just audio there's not a lot of heat and power there so the first thing we want to do want to get this 5u4 tube in here we don't need anything else and power it up and we'll see if the power transformer power supply is good if we just take a little bit of a look at this we can see that this is roached. That right there is completely roached. 
Oh crap, have I been in manual focus all this whole time? Oh man, I'm not going to go back and redo that whole damn intro. Uh, it just most of it's going to repeat so you'll catch it. Anyway, this is roached here. And you can see this here is completely roached. Hopefully these these coils are in good enough shape. I mean, originally at one time there was paper wrapped around this, several layers, and this these would have been supported and braced in the paper, but I guess they're okay. Um, as I said earlier, all this wiring is cut. It looks like somebody removed the chassis and they didn't know what they were doing, so they just cut all the wiring. Of course, the speaker is completely hollow. Speaker wires cut. This is the vertical output transformer, I believe. And as long as we don't, and this is one reason I don't clean these things, is because can you imagine if I was to hit this with compressed air or pressure wash it, like is suggested so often, it would it would just blow this apart. I mean, this is the winding, which is just totally exposed so same thing with the audio output transformer I mean this thing is baked this is always the deal with these whenever you work on something like this you want to take a good long look at it and slowly kind of inspect everything and see where I mean look at this this used to be twin lead this used to be twin lead and the plastic is just so gone that the plastic dissolved and the wires that were within the twin lead are just suspended in midair isn't that cool Anyway, uh, I believe these are the line input. At least I hope they are. So let me get going on this. Let me use the watt meter. And I've got a light bulb, 60 watt light bulb in series with this thing. This is kind of a safety precaution. Hey, I don't even know if I'm hooked onto the right wires there. So if anything was to short, it would uh, a light bulb would take up the slack. So here we go. I'm going to plug it in. And well, it did something for a second there, and then it stopped. So the light bulb briefly light up, and then it went away. What happened? power there. If I short that, the light bulb comes on. So. What's going on here? Stand by. Let's see, I think this one... Ugh. There, oh wait, there it is. There it is, right there. You can see that. So we have 18 watts. And that should be pretty much all... Power factor is pretty good. That's probably because of the light resistive load of the light bulb there. Added into the inductive part of the transformer. So here we go. Um, 18 watts. Let's add a 5U4 into the equation. Uh, 
Oh, and this is all live. See the load increasing there? The filament heated up and now we probably have a filter capacitor that's reforming 35 watts. So we have a filter capacitor that's reforming at the expense of something and you can see it getting dimmer there it looks like and yes it is dropping very slowly but it is dropping absolutely crusterific sockets man it's like Ugh, it's like sticking a tube into sand. All right, I'd like to measure the B plus, please. So B plus goes to this 200 milliamp fuse here, uh, which I assume is that guy right there. And we have 134 volts on this side of the fuse and we have four volts on that side of the fuse so that neither well that fuse is baked it's like that expired hard uh, 140 volts is too low for there not being any load on this thing at all I'm gonna pull the 5U4 out Boy, did that drop like a rock. We'll put the 5U4 back in. Even with this light bulb, that should probably still be up around 250 because there's no load on it to pull it down. You know, this is creeping up. And... It's still too low. So let's measure this uh, pin 4 and pin 6. It should be 265 on each side. I've got 253 there and 253 there. So I've definitely got the AC here. Um... So let me go back and check the AC here. I've got 200 millivolts of AC and 120 volts of DC. What is wrong with this picture? Is that choke bad? Okay, I got 150 volts on this side of the choke. I never thought I would say that this is convenient to have the failed insulation, but it is. And 150 volts on that side of the choke. 155, actually. So, wh what's going on here? Is this a bad rectifier tube or a bad socket? Let me find another 5U4. And actually, I take that back with the light bulb. I took, I bypassed the light bulb and we're up to 275 volts. I guess maybe the filament wasn't getting hot enough in the rectifier. Anyway, let me get a bigger light bulb. I don't like not having that protection. Look at this. The wattage went up to 80 watts. All right, this is a, a two, 150 watt retina burning uncoated heaters what this is and we're up to 245 volts with this guy at 51 watts I just like having that protection in there uh, just in case that power transformer that is so rusty and crusty and been out in the rain for 40 years decides to internally short I would rather have the light bulb take it than, than these little crappy clip leads that would explode and probably burn my crotch the way I'm sitting. So, 
yeah, the protection is good because this this thing is is unfused. There is no fuse in this circuit. All right, next step. We're going to put the damper tube in the 6X4, which should give us voltage right here to the plate cap of the 6BQ6. So putting that, so that DC voltage comes through here, through here, through here, up to here. So that should give us voltage here putting that damper in and I believe that we can test the boost capacitor see if this boost filter right here is leaky that voltage will work its way through here without that tube in or if that capacitor is leaky so you can essentially test this capacitor to see if it's leaky by checking the voltage here right now without this tube in. Checking that, we currently have 194 volts there. So one of those two capacitors is leaky. Except we're not really gonna worry about that right at the moment. Let's pop the damper in and see what this voltage does. So we go to our tube chart here in the SAMS and we find where the 6X4 damper goes in which would be right here and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug it in and we should see the light get a little brighter which it did and when that warms up we should see this voltage come up And not come up like that, but like come up all the way. Mm. Oh, you know what? I'm being a dunce. That fuse is blown. Duh. All right, we got a new fuse in there, and and you know I'm thinking about this, but that fuse popped. Uh, that fuse is simply for the horizontal circuit. It almost would suggest that something catastrophic went wrong with this TV and that's why it was dumped rather than fixed. So uh, most of the TVs I found in the dump over there and other stuff were just dumped there because they cleaned out the employee housing and just dumped everything that the employees left behind. But um, I don't know we're gonna we're gonna get this horizontal circuit working before anything else because that that being blown is a suggestion that anyway enough of that uh, with the new fuse 267 volts on the plate cap of the horizontal output now let me pull this out and let's see what it drops down to so it drops down to 213 which is the leakage through the capacitors. Isn't that nice? Isn't it just heartwarming to know that this thing is filled with leaky capacitors? All right, next next subject. Let's install the horizontal output. Or actually, let me let me install the horizontal oscillator multivibrator 6SN7 which 6SN7 goes right there. All right, 6SN7. Now the reason we, we, we would like the oscillator to be running, that way we don't cremate the horizontal output tube, which we won't allow to happen anyway. Now I'd like to see a negative voltage right here on pin 5. That would say that this is running. Alright, so I, I sprayed a little bit of this. will probably get my channel taken down in today's world. Um, so I want to measure 5 and I don't know why they got a missing pin here. But 
eight seven six five what the hell is going on back there all right uh, raging cat fight take three let's see eight seven six five let's try and get in here And we have nothing. Stand by. Actually, whatever is here is making the meter wig out. Uh, so let's just plug the tube in. All right, this is a very handy tool to have when you can actually use it. Uh, it measures milliamps of cathode current on the horizontal output tube, so you can make sure you're not going to cook the tube. So it gives you the current for 6BQ6, 6CU6, DQ6, DQ6. But the problem here is this thing has all eight pins, and this thing does not have one of the holes drilled, and the tubes do not, the tubes accommodate the socket in the TV. So this is unfortunately not usable. Now this is a 6 DQ6, and you can use either a 6BQ6, which is that lighter duty, or you can use a six, the heavier duty 6DQ6. And the TV calls for a 6BQ6, so the TV calls for the lighter version of it. And in this era, Sam's was not giving you the cathode current. We're, we're going to assume that it should be under 100 mils. I'm just letting this warm up. Okay, now we don't know if that tube is any good. We don't know if the flyback is any good. And we don't know if the yoke is connected. We just don't know anything. We have no idea. And that does get brighter when I connect. Let me see. Okay, that's with the plate cap disconnected. That's with it connected. Our B plus is down to 135 volts with the light bulb. Now I'm gonna try just for the fun of it, I'm gonna pull the oscillator out and the the if it's working, the oscillator is working, you should see it in here, and I'm not seeing it. But I'm hearing something. Okay, with the light bulb bypassed, we're getting, the B plus has 131 millivolts on it, so it's definitely not a filter capacitor issue. That filter seems okay. We've got 225 volts, uh, and unfortunately I can't, oh yeah, leaky, that's the leaky finger. So we are driving, one hell of a lot of current through that tube right there. And I have that tube marked as a little weak, so good tube to sacrifice. So for some reason, could be the frequency's way off. Let me do a current measurement. Okay, just put my current amp, a little amp meter in here, which just would be the same as the cathode current, or the tor total horizontal output and like we said, 100 milliamps max. This should have had a 200 milliamp fuse in it. I probably put 100 and something milliamps so we can see why the original fuse blew. So that would execute that tube in short order. Now this could be capacitors, this could be the yoke, this could be the horizontal output, the, the flyback. This could be 
uh, the frequency's way off. All right, the crustification of uh, ugh. Who knows? Interesting. It seems like this might have been the problem. So check this out. If I rotate it. You hear when the frequency drops there? So let's see, that's croco tweakulating. Ooh. Might as well have some fun here, right? Look at that, brand new, roasted. Oh, well, that stinks, and I'm outside. Um, so do we have high voltage? It sounds like it. Well, of course, the CRT is not going to be lit up because all the wires are cut to it. And I don't really care about that, but it sounds like it has high voltage. Okay, here we go. So, if you watch this, you usually see a dip when the oscillator starts. You'll see this come up. I'm not seeing it there. I guess it wasn't cooled off enough, but... What we're looking for is we're looking for high voltage here. I hear high voltage. I think I'm quite reaching it. There we go. We got uh, 12 kilovolts, 12 to 13 kilovolts. And this wants to suggest we have 11 kilovolts. Wow, that really came together that easy, huh? That's almost amazing. In fact, that's beyond amazing. So I haven't, haven't done anything off video. Everything you've seen me do here has been on video. So we have 100 milliamps uh, cathode or plate current using 110 watts we're generating 12 kilovolts and I don't know what the B plus is right now so we always have to in include the wildlife you know that crawls out of the TV so yeah alright the next step is I'm assuming that the yoke is on line because the high voltage has come up so high. Usually these things won't develop high voltage without the yoke in place. That's a part of the tuned circuit. So I think the next step here is to connect, attempt to connect all of these cut CRT leads. This is a pretty neat device. It's made by Teledyne Kinetics, and I doubt you can even find anything like this anymore. But basically, with this old wire, what this does is it heats this up and it lets it melts the insulation. So then you can just pull it off because stripping this old wire, you know, it would be probably break the socket or something. Okay, so those are connected. Now these colors are standardized, and I believe yellow is the cathode. Brown and black, of course, are the filaments. I forget what green and red are, but I can't find yellow here. And of course, this is yellow here, so this would be the cathode, and they're calling for 50 volts there. It's interesting they got those two tied together so we got one two 245 volts 
So we need to look for this test point two. That would be where the yellow would connect. And according to this, test point two would be right there. So is that the third one over? So is this is this our yellow right here? One, two, three. That would probably make sense. Uh, someone chlorco tweaculated that. We don't care about that right now. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to ground this. And grounding this is an old TV man's trick to test the CRT because if you ground the cathode, if you ground this yellow, you turn that gun on 100% and you should get bright red or bright raster, bright line or a bright raster. In this case, we're just going to get a hopefully a bright line. We might have to move the uh, magnet around. I wonder if there's even any magnetic thing left to this. According to this, it's very magnetic. I think the next thing maybe is to try and clean this off a little bit. I swear this actually looks like it's full of mud on the inside. Like it was sitting on its face and I think that the water got in it and filled it with mud. All right, well, the first thing I'm going to do is get the high voltage up. Then I'm going to ground this yellow wire. All right, what happened here? Okay, there we go. Uh, back at 11 kilovolts. And we had nothing on the screen. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ground, I don't want to, oh there it is, there it is, see if I can get back far enough and show you, there it is, there's your line, and look at the mud in there. Look at the f mud inside there. Okay, I don't want to do that for very long. Yeah, if you don't have any of the thing, if you don't have anything else, but you have high voltage, you can ground the yellow, which is the cathode, and it'll turn the CRT on 100%. So you could, we could probably do that and watch a high voltage drop here. Again, you don't want to do it for very long. Yep. See the high voltage drop that's on, that's off, on, off. So yeah, you don't want to do that for very long because you'll screen burn. And I, I wouldn't want to screen burn a beauty like this. I mean, that would just be so, so wrong. All right, next section. Vertical multivibrator, multi-output. Multi-output, yes. Vertical multivibrator output. Sync separator, this is where the pulses get divided off from the lower frequency vertical and the higher frequency horizontal sync pulse. So 6AU8, I guess I have to find a 6AU8. I found the 12B4 and that is a rare tube or it seems to be a rare tube. A triode output. So hopefully we can get this section to work. And this section is often the most sensitive because it's low frequency and it has a bunch of capacitors in it. And when these capacitors get screwed up, it don't work right. Uh, so I need to find a 6AU8. I couldn't find a 6AU8, but they say a 6AW8 is the same thing, so here we go. I don't want to burn these tubes up. They're uh, kind of rare, I think, at least in my stash. So if this works, we should hear the vertical, the, the 15 
hertz or whatever it is. I hear it running very slow all right since I hear that running I'm gonna try grounding this again and we'll see if we got any vertical deflection yes we do So let me see if I can adjust that. Oh. Yeah, the pots are pots are bad. You know what? I, I got to get this mud out of here. I cannot see what I'm doing. Alright, well check this out. Isn't this beautiful? But it gets even better. You know can see through this item. Mud. Just mud. Filled with mud. Alright, we'll have, we'll have to uh, fire this sucker up now without uh, a layer of dirt on it. Look at the difference. Unbelievable. I think I would pardon Scooter Libby too. What kind of name is Scooter Libby? It's like some kind of Chinese toy that sets your garage on fire. Alright, I've been adjusting the vertical. And this looks kind of crappy. I think it should be a lot brighter. I'm going to attempt to move the ion trap. Yeah, the ion magnet, I moved it and I got it a lot brighter, but I, I kind of, I've been pulling it back and I've got it bottomed out here, so it's like it could go back further. Uh, maybe I could try turning it over. But yeah, I've got it a lot brighter. Anyway, it, at this point, this shows us at least that Vertical and horizontal deflection, high voltage are working, power supply is working. Um, and we should be able to get a picture on it. it. Might take a lot of work, but I can always feed just video into the video output tube and it should work. I got the 6AL5 double diode uh, horizontal thingy mcdingy in there what is it called blanking out horizontal afc 6by6 sink separator and i got two 6aw8s in here uh one is part of the vertical multi vibrator third if the other one is the video and something else but anyway at this point i should be able to feed video into here into this coil and we should have a picture so there you go and i got the yellow wire hooked up which was to here i did figure that out and i ohmed out 
the brightness and the contrast pot and they're both working. I don't even think I'm going to waste the time on the tuner on this set. Um, at the most I might back up here and try and feed an IF input into it and get the audio to work just simply for the experimental part of it. Right now I'm just trying to get a picture on it. Alright, I just decided to uh, I need two 6CB6s, a 6BN6, and a 6AQ5. And this looks like a 6BN6 right here. This is the, yes, there we go, 6BN6. This is the Zenith audio detector tube. And as far as the 6CB6s go, I'm going to look in here. 6CB6. 6AU6, I think that's pretty common, may not work in all circuits. 6AW6, let me see what I can find. That's a lot of tubes. Tubes are fully populated. 6AQ6, 6AQ6, 6AW8, 6AW8. These were supposed to be the 6CB6s. These were the ones that said may not work in all circuits. 6BN6, this is the Zenith Buzzomatic detector, and this is the buzz elimination control, which never really worked. 6AQ5 audio output, sync separator, horizontal phase detector double diode, vertical output. We've been through the rest of them. Uh, a new speaker. And power has been applied. Uh, let's just see what happens. I, I don't expect it to work. I expect it maybe to work with a video signal. And the other thing is, I have a limited time on this because the capacitors will start to short. Uh, they might run for an hour or so, but then a lot of them are going to start to fail in short. This is a B&K 1077 uh, television analyst, and this is the old school version of the more modern one that I use, the solid state one. So this will basically, this generates a test pattern using this ultraviolet CRT and this gel. And then there's a flying spot scanner tube here that it projects onto. Um, I keep it covered with a toilet paper tube. I don't know why. But anyway, this will basically, this is basically like a little miniature television station. And this will generate that test pattern on a video out. It has the sync out, it has the audio out. It will do color, which we can turn off. Then we have RF out and bias if we want to bias the IF. And it will do UHF out, IF out, and the channel output, which we're going to try the IF. And then this, this over here is for testing sweep circuits. So this will test your... Um, you can drive the horizontal output or the vertical output to see if the oscillator is screwed up. Uh, this will do your ring test for your flyback and yoke and coils. This thing will do all kinds of stuff. I kind of like the newer computerized one better, but uh, for this old thing, let's hook this up. I'm going to hook up, I'm going to feed the IF into the IF from the tuner there. And we'll see what happens. I can't get much audio activity, so there's something going on there. I really don't expect a whole lot, but you never know. You never know. So I've got this on IF. We're going to be in the 40 something megahertz range. And let's see what we get here. Oh crap, look at that. And it actually sounds like the audio's working.
right, I gotta play with this. I have to play with this. I, I, I be damned if that doesn't seem like it's working. It's just the vertical and horizontal are out. All right, here we go. Horizontal oscillator frequency. Wow. Vertical oscillator frequency. <laughs> Boy, that's fun. Jacked up looking picture. Okay, well look at this. If I crank the linearity way up I can actually I can actually get that thing to produce a picture look at that this thing has been sitting out in the most horrible conditions. Now I haven't changed one part yet. I haven't changed one capacitor, one resistor. All I've done is repopulated the tubes and gone through a startup and I have to come back and do this when it's dark outside. But there you can see it right there. Would anyone believe that this thing is working on channel 3? I'm not making it up. I'm, I'm going into channel 3. All I did was I connected it to channel 3 here, channel 3 here, and I pulled the, the rusty shields off those tubes and just wiggled them around. And the tuner, that tuner is working. Something special about Zenith, man. There's really something special about Zenith. All this is bad capacitors. Most likely this, this crap this is doing right now, this is bad capacitors because it... And one problem with Zenith, Zenith is they use integrators in these, which are like a cap capacitor-resistor combination. And you can make them, but they're, they're very difficult to make. Just to throw this in here, this little thing right here, M9, this is what's known as an integrator, and it looks like a little disc capacitor with three leads coming out of it. And it's actually a series of resistors and capacitors. And somewhere I even have a chart that shows the value so that you can build your own. But the There's basically two vertical problems with this set, very pronounced, which is the deflection at the top of the screen and the rolling. And usually when you get deflection problems at the top of the screen, it's in this feedback line right here. Usually at the bottom of the screen, it's something down in this part. Um, these are very suspect, these integrators. They have a high failure rate, they always did. And like I say, we have soft sync, and there's this is the sync line right here, the sync pulse coming in to the vertical multi vibrator, and we got an integrator here, and we got an integrator here. So we got integrators in both 
of the areas that are having trouble with the vertical deflection circuit. Um, I'm not going to spend the time. First of all, these are almost impossible to, to diagnose without just switching them out. Not that it couldn't be that capacitor right there and that capacitor right there. 99% chance those are bad, but are they going to solve this? Uh, it's with the known failure rate of these integrators, it's not worth the time to dig into this thing. All right, day number two, when I was looking at the video in the video editor, I realized that I didn't show the backside of this and the components. So I'm trying to figure out how to get it apart. And it looks like this pulls off of here. So this whole thing stays as all together the chassis and this front piece so I think what I do is I got the screws out so I set it on its front and try and get this corroded ass thing apart I don't know how that's gonna work but I'll try it and that's exactly how it comes apart this comes off of the chassis and boy look at this Yes, I. Throw all this away, clean this up a little bit. Then we'll have a look at the underside. All right, so this is how it comes apart. And. Let's have a look at the components in here. Seems like it has quite a few disk capacitors. This is probably one of the reasons why it kind of worked without me doing much to it. Uh. Now this here, these are all in the vertical circuit, which could be why the vertical circuit is working so crappy. Um. I don't know where I'm going to insert this clip into the video. It was done after after the fact and I decided to come back and look at it. I believe that this right here this is one of those integrators that's a combination of capa capacitors and resistors and those fail a lot in Zenith. <clears throat> So I was thinking, I have a lot of other televisions to work on, but if you guys want to chime in and let me know if I should come back to this one and try and get it to work, produce a decent picture, let me know in the comments. If not, I can move along to something else. But I will let this set here until the video comes out and I get the feedback and I can always just take this and put this in the dumpster which were my plans of course this this here is the fine tuning shaft and it is completely frozen it's supposed this is supposed to rotate around this shaft So, to go any further with it, I'd probably have to break these two shafts apart so I could adjust the fine tuning. But yeah, the. Tuner actually worked. Rusty, crusty. So anyway, that's a look at the inside, the component side of the Zenith. Alright, I can't believe I'm about to do this, but fill her up.
hose her down. Look at that. Gonna oh, ruin the customer's beautiful television. I can't believe the thing is actually well, I ruined it. It was working. Oops. Yep, I ruined it. Had it working pretty good there for a minute. Where's the fine tuning on this crap, or is it all frozen together? All right, well, I'm struggling with this fine tuning thing is completely rusted to the outside knob. All right, well, I got the DTV converter hooked up to this thing and kind of the first thing out of this thing was breaking news. President Trump is expected to speak on Syria tonight. So can you imagine being entombed asleep for 40 years and waking up to that? Trump at the White House about new developments in Syria. The president has hinted in a short time ago. I ordered the United States Armed Forces to launch precision strikes on targets associated with the chemical weapons capabilities of Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad. A combined operation with the armed forces of France and the United Kingdom is now underway. We thank them both. Tonight I want to speak with you about why we have taken this action. One year ago, Assad launched a savage chemical weapons attack against his own innocent people. The United States responded with 58 missile strikes that destroyed 20% of the Syrian Air Force. Last Saturday, the Assad regime again deployed chemical weapons to slaughter innocent civilians, this time in the town of Roma, near the Syrian capital. Damascus. This massacre was a significant escalation in a pattern of chemical weapons use by that very terrible regime. The evil and the despicable attack left mothers and fathers, infants and children, thrashing in pain and gasping for air. These are not the actions of a man. Instead, following the horrors of World War I a century ago, civilized nations joined together to ban chemical warfare. Chemical weapons are uniquely dangerous, not only because they inflict gruesome suffering, but because even small amounts can unleash widespread devastation. The purpose of our actions tonight is to establish a strong deterrent against the production, spread, and use of chemical weapons. Establishing this deterrent is a vital national security interest of the United States. All right, we get it, we get it. Yeah, it is very, very, very washed out. To these atrocities, we'll integrate I can't adjust the fine tuning because this is our frozen. national power. Military but I think we're done here. Resurrected from the dead to uh, play the war song, I guess. Chemical you say about it. I also have a message tonight for the two governments most responsible for supporting, equipping, and financing the criminal Assad regime. To Iran and to Russia, I ask, what kind of a nation wants to be associated with the mass murder? innocent men, women, 
I came back out here in the evening and um, looks a lot better when the sun's not out. The sun is great for videoing working on the TV, but it's not so hot for working on uh, uh, videoing the actual set itself. Now you can see this. You know what I want to do? I want to uh, I need to get it to stop rolling but I want to try and get it with the super slow-mo on my new phone. Film it at a thousand frames per second. So you can actually see the dot. But I got to get it to stabilize first. So that's interesting. You can see the retrace there. See the retrace, the splatter retrace at the top. I'll try and cut this video into the end, but this is a thousand frames a second. With any of these videos, this is the money shot right here. The glowing warmth of the vacuum bulbs from the back. <laughs> 